For centuries, there were no vultures in this northern part of Israel. But today, the vulture population is exploding. I'll explain why in this episode of The Prophetic Connection. This place, the Mount of Olives, is very near. Fulfilling the prophecy, waiting for the day when the Messiah will come. This morning I'm standing on the lower slopes of the Golan Heights. In the year AD 66, the Roman army swept through here, killing many hundreds, thousands of Jewish men, women, and children. Not far from here is a place called Gamla. It was a fortified city, and the Romans eventually captured it as well, killing many more Jews. But at least 5,000 Jews, is, it is estimated by the Roman historian Josephus, 5,000 Jews committed mass suicide. They jumped off the cliffs at Gamla. Ironically, this is the region where the vultures are multiplying not far from the Sea of Galilee, and beyond the Sea of Galilee, a valley called Armageddon. The prophets of the Bible talk about God summoning the scavenger birds to the battle of Armageddon, where they will feast on the carcasses of those slain there. So 2,000 years ago, many Jews died here, killed by the Romans, or choosing to die by suicide rather than give in to the Romans. But a future battle is going to happen not far from here at a place called Armageddon. In that battle, many more will die. And so the vultures, it seems, are multiplying. Most people have heard the term Armageddon, but how many know what it means? Today, the term is used loosely. People speak of financial and political Armageddons, but what is the true biblical meaning of the term? The term Armageddon is from the Hebrew Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo. Megiddo was an ancient city. It's in the Bible. I believe there's going to be a little literal battle there. It's a huge area. It's fertile. It's flat. It would make a great battleground. I believe it's going to literally happen. But if Armageddon is a literal place, the scene of what could be called the mother of all battles. Who are the opposing sides? Well, Armageddon, uh, the term Armageddon uh, means to me really a battle from which neither side can retreat. And what makes Armageddon the final battle is that the, the devil knows that, that if he doesn't win there, he'll never win. And, um, and God, likewise, has chosen that place as, as the place where the devil is, is finally defeated. Now, the actual valley of Armageddon is named uh, as it is uh, for two Hebrew words, Har Megiddo, which means the mount or the mountain of Megiddo. And of course, it's referring to the ancient city of Megiddo. And what made Megiddo um, so significant was that it was the town that controlled the trade route that passed through the Jezreel Valley, the trade route that connected the two great empires of the ancient world between Egypt and Assyria. And so some might say that the Armageddon factor really is a, a, a conflict from which there is no retreat, uh, a conflict over the great trade routes of the world and, uh, and who will control the wealth of the planet. Um, I believe there's that aspect involved. Uh, but because I'm conservative in my uh, interpretation of scripture, I believe that also there will be a physical conflict in that very valley. And um, I believe that we're rapidly approaching those days. You know, I've often stood up on the overlook, uh, looking down at the, where the Battle of Armageddon will be in the Valley of Megiddo. And that's where Elijah ran in front of Ahab, and that's where all kinds of wars have happened and armies have come and gone. And you see this gigantic plateau of where this could actually happen. And when nations come against Israel, this final battle there is going to be so 
intense, so horrific, so uh, maybe even nuclear, that the Lord's going to intervene. And I think we're getting closer and closer and closer. If you want to put Gog and Magog together in this whole equation, as some scholars do, well, they're coming from the north. Look what's happening with Russia. Look what's happening with Iran. And so I think we're getting really, really close. Today, Israel is experiencing increasing isolation among the community of nations. At the same time, the Jewish nation is being pressured to give away more land in pursuit of an elusive peace. Ultimately, however, the heart of this ongoing struggle is Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem. The nations, collectively speaking, are trying to change the status quo, either by dividing Jerusalem as part of a two-state solution for Israel and the Palestinians, or by internationalizing Jerusalem. But could this fight over Jerusalem be the trigger event that leads to Armageddon and to God's promised intervention on Israel's side? In other words, is there a direct connection between Jerusalem and Armageddon? So when we're dealing with Zechariah 14 and this, this final struggle where the Mount of Olives plays a very prominent role in it and the mountain splits. Again, from the Jewish perspective, it's not necessarily taken literally. The mountain has to literally split. But uh, what's being referred to is, again, that the, the epicenter of the struggle is going to be in Jerusalem, sort of like the final showdown. Israel, the Middle East may be a big battlefield, and Israel may be a, a microcosm of that, but the real epicenter of the conflict is focused on the place of greatest spiritual potential and where the forces of evil want to keep the Jewish people from connecting because the Jewish people's ability to change and impact the world is directly related to controlling that site. And therefore, they're going to do everything in their power to keep the Jewish people away from that site. So when, the, when we're getting vision of the prophets, and remember someone like Zechariah, Zechariah, when he's getting his prophecy, is getting in the form of a vision. Moses, the prophet, hears God speak. So his prophecy is very unambiguous. It's so to speak the word of God that he is transmitting to the Jewish people. When, when Zechariah is seeing his vision, it's not meant to necessarily be taken literally as mountains split, earthquakes take. It could happen, by the way. There's a lot of seismic activity down there a few miles away from us. So that's a possibility. But when I read that quote, I understand it more as an allegorical level of the final struggle taking place here literally could literally mean battles in Jerusalem. Well, even that doesn't necessarily have to be literal. And this, this scenario that's brought not just by Zechariah, but you know, Gog and Magog of the nations of the world coming against the Jewish people and this mighty, this mighty horde, this vast army um, doesn't, you know, and he, and he talks about chariots and horses. Obviously, that's his military technology for the day. But what's the image? I always stand back and say, what's the picture the prophet's trying to give us here? And he's talking about the nations of the world fighting against the Jewish people, which doesn't mean that all 192 nations of the General Assembly have to get on planes and land at Ben Gurion Airport and start fighting battles. It could mean that we're involved in a physical struggle with our enemies and the rest of the world stands back and either is neutral or supports our enemies in trying to destroy us. But the image is clearly, with the, I would say with the broadest brushstrokes, is an image of Israel standing alone against the, its enemies in a very desperate situation and that salvation comes at the last minute when all seems lost. Again, that image of the, uh, you know, the cavalry coming over the hill to save the Jewish people. But, and, it, and it's a very dangerous scenario, it's scary. But the bottom line is, is even when we're, our back is against the wall, right when we're fighting for Jerusalem in Jerusalem, that we survive, that salvation comes, the enemies are destroyed, and, and good triumphs and evil is destroyed. But how could Israel possibly survive a military onslaught by most, if not all, nations? Zechariah's image of Jerusalem as a burdensome stone, like all who touch it get lacerated, can be understood on multiple levels. But the way I understand it in terms of current events is that it's really just as Jerusalem is so key to the Jewish people, the spiritual power supply, that nexus between heaven and earth, it's gonna be the issue of contention and it's the issue which is, you know, from the Jewish perspective, the holiest spot in the world for the Jewish people isn't the Western Wall down there, it's what's on top. It's the top of that Mount Moriah. That's the stone, literally. It's called the Evan Shatia, the foundation stone that is the nourishment from which the whole world, not just the Jewish people, is nourished from. But it's such an, a critical component that the Jewish people can't give up on it. 
And it's one of those red lines that the vast majority of the Jewish people, even Jews who are disconnected from Judaism and are into the peace process, agree that you know, Jerusalem can't be divided again as a city. I believe there will be a time when Israel is isolated as a, as a nation. And um, the messianic remnant will be much greater than it is today. And that Israel's existence will be a testimony to the, to the, to the faithfulness of God and many forces around the world will be, will be gathered to extinguish that light. Uh, I believe it, then we're going to see uh, God step into the picture. Right now, Israel still has friends and uh, still has uh, a kind of a self-confidence uh, and, a, and uh, a sense that we're able to somehow deal with our enemies. But I believe in that day, our enemies will be so great that only if God intervenes uh, can we see any hope. And I believe that's what makes that final conflict really a, a fu the last one. And in it, we see the triumph of the forces and the purposes of God that lead us into his righteous rule on this planet for a thousand years. According to the Bible, there will be two sides at Armageddon those who are on the Lord's side and those who are not. When Armageddon occurs, individuals and nations will face the same choice, for God or against Him. When I think of the last end times battle in the Valley of Armageddon, I'm thinking first of all of the scripture in Joel where it says, multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision. You know, we are at that place where people need to make a choice and they need to choose righteousness or unrighteousness. They need to choose a holy God or they need to choose a demonized Satan. They need to choose eternal life or they need to choose eternal judgment. But I think of it also in practical terms for I was a soldier in the Israeli army, the IDF, and my army base was right in the midst of the Valley of Megiddo or Armageddon. And we know of the tourist site where you can see layers of history and go through tunnels and go into these deep places under the earth. But then I also think of when I arrived to my army unit, every time I would go when I was checking in for my full-time army service or my combat reserve status for many, many years, I thought of what will this place be like? It's a vast, beautiful valley, very flat in many places easy for a military to drop down with its helicopters, to unload uh, massive amounts of equipment in the north of Israel, to mount a campaign to attack a whole nation, and to then fall on the mountains of Israel. This is an awesome battle that scripture talks about, but one which will be very deadly for the nations that are really anti-God, anti-Christ, anti the kingdom of our God, but we serve the greatest military general of all times who will come to that place and judge the nations. So it is not a time to wait, but now a time for people to make a choice. Which side and which army do you choose to stand with? is dark, the clouds ominous today, perhaps appropriately so because I'm standing in the valley of Armageddon. Over my shoulder, the fortress called Har Megiddo. Har means hill or mound of Megiddo, and in the English language it becomes Armageddon. Here the great final battle, the mother of all battles, is going to take place according to the prophecies of the Bible. John the brother of James, the first of the disciples that Jesus called, was given an incredible revelation in his old age. He may have been in his mid-90s, imprisoned on the island of Patmos, a Roman penal colony in the Aegean Sea. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to him there and unfolded the future, revealed to him, and that's why we call it the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ that he gave to John but for all of us. And as we move through the book 
of Revelation, we come to chapter 13. The stage begins to be set for the final battle of Armageddon. In chapter 13 and verse 1, and John in his visions says, Then I stood in the sand of the sea, presumably the sea of humanity, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name, which reveals the nature, the character of the Antichrist, because he's a blasphemer. He blasphemes God. And the symbolism of the crowns are the authority that he has. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power. We read elsewhere in Revelation, the dragon is a synonym for the devil. Gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. So something's going to happen that makes the whole world marvel, in fact, tremble at the person of the Antichrist. It says, in fact, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. He seems to have a sort of a resurrection after a wounding. And that only makes the world uh, worship him all the more. And so it says in verse 4, so they worship the dragon, meaning Satan, who gave authority to the beast, meaning the Antichrist. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, perhaps a temple in Jerusalem, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And then this, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world is Jesus of Nazareth. And it seems that there are books recorded in heaven where those who have his salvation, their names are written in that book. But all other names that are not written in this book, it says, um, all that dwell on the earth, um, the Antichrist has power over all of them. And then as we continue to read, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So we put all of this together and we discover the Antichrist has tremendous power, authority, and influence. He will be perhaps a charismatic figure like Adolf Hitler and seemingly even more evil, if that were possible, than Adolf Hitler. He's going to have tremendous religious influence, political influence, economic influence as reflected here, where no one can buy or sell unless they have his mark or his number. You know, we're living in an age when chip plant, uh, implants are um, possible, where dogs, cats are implanted with a chip so that if they're ever lost, they can easily be found. I'm amazed to see the popularity of tattoo parlors, uh, especially in the last few years, they've sprung up. And it's difficult to meet a young person today who doesn't have a tattoo or more somewhere on their body. In fact, some people are covered in tattoos. It has become such a popular trend. We remember that during the European Holocaust, the Nazis put a tattoo on the arms of Jews. As even on children, the tattoo mark was burned into the arms of children. And that reflected the evil of the Nazi regime. Well, it seems that this Antichrist figure who is also evil, doing the bidding of Satan, will use similar identification marks. And if you don't bear those marks, you cannot buy or sell, and you'd be shut out. And of course, Christians know, because the Word of God tells us, that we must not take the mark of the beast. So imagine the position that would put Christians in when this economy comes into um, full force, if you like. And here in verse 18 of Revelation 13, we read, Here is wisdom. 
Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. There are many interpretations of 666 and what it means, but I think the key thing to notice is it is the number of a man. So we're talking about a human being, an individual who's going to rise in prominence, the lawless one that Paul writes about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, but who is at the same time anti-God, anti-Christ. And then we continue to read, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit in them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And this, of course, is Jesus of Nazareth. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he received, deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So we would discover that God has a plan to bring these forces of evil into the valley of Armageddon. And the plan is outlined in Revelation 16, and they gathered them together in the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon, Har Megiddo, Mound of Megiddo, this ancient fortress, fortress of King Solomon and many others, that gives its name to this valley, Armageddon. The final battle between the forces of heaven and the evil armies that are on earth and the nations that will gather here under Antichrist, but their end will be sure because Jesus Christ is coming with the armies of heaven with power and great glory. George Friedrich Handel, the great composer, captured that in the Hallelujah Chorus in his oratorio, uh, speaking of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Battle of Armageddon will be about the settling of accounts. Jesus Christ will come with the armies of heaven to defeat the Antichrist who has been the instrument of Satan on earth. And a new world order will be established here at Jerusalem. The Bible says that Jesus will rule from here for a thousand years. During that time, Satan will be bound, his power stripped. But at the end of thousand years, He's loosed for a little while, and then God's final judgment over him will occur. Christ will usher in a new world, world order, and that prayer, thy kingdom come, will be fulfilled. Listen to the words as John describes what happens after that in Revelation chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and will be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away.